And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to be talking about Matteo Messino Denaro. If you don't know who he is, you could do a lot of research for yourself. Uh, there's little known about his younger days, but I'm going to try to fill in a couple of gaps. Uh, Matteo Messino Denaro, a.k.a. also known as Diabolic, uh, was born in Castelvetrano, Sicily in April of 1962. Uh, he was born into the Denaro crime family, which is a powerhouse crime family in Sicily. His father, Francesco Messino Denaro, also known as Don Ciccio, was a capo in the Capo Matamento in Castel Vetrano. Uh, capo Matamento is another way of saying boss of his territory uh, and is usually a member of the Sicilian Commission. He was also the head of the Mafia Commission in Trapani, Sicily. Uh, by the age of 14, Matteo had allegedly committed 10 of his first 50 murders that have been alleged that he had participated in. Uh, he would kill a hotel manager because the manager had suggested he had slept with younger women. Uh, Matteo didn't like that, so he killed him. Uh, Matteo didn't hesitate to kill at will. That's a large part of who he is uh, and was, and he was well known for killing his rival, Vincenzo Malazzo, uh from Alcamo. And he went so far as to strangle Malazzo's girlfriend, who was three months pregnant at the time. So we can see uh, murder was never a problem with him. Uh, I think if you're going to compare any American Cosa Nostra leader to that guy, big difference there. Uh, American mob doesn't kill women, especially pregnant women. Uh, so it sort of kind of makes him a psychopath in, in so many ways. Uh, his pedigree was deep. And his father was actually uh, a soldier and armed guard for the Diali crime family. And the Diali crime family were wealthy landowners and founders of the Banco uh, Sicila, which was a bank. Uh, and he would become the chief semi-accountant uh, for the Diali crime family holdings. Uh, this is Francesco. Uh, as a reward, they would give Francesco a plot of land, which was a big deal in those days. And he ran a huge estate and the Zangara territory, which is in Castel Vetrano. Uh, the issue was, though, the actual owner of the estate itself was Toto Rina. Uh, in 1983, Antonio Diali re resigned from his post as the board of the Banco Sicila because uh, he showed up on a list of Freemasons, uh, which back in those days, and, and sort of Catholicism today, uh, it, they always believed that masonry was a cult, it was satanic worship and a front for illegitimate enterprises. Uh, his son would ultimately become a senator for Silvio Berscoloni Forza Italia party in 1996. Uh, Francesco Denaro would die in 19, 1998, and his son would become the de facto leader of uh, Castel Vetrano and many neighboring cities, while Vincenzo Vigra uh, ran the city of Trapani and its surroundings. Uh, we've talked at length before about Italy and, and sort of how it operates differently. Uh, not one faction or group itself runs Italy. It's cut up into turf, small towns, communities run by large families, and some smaller clannish type of families. Uh, Virga would be arrested in 2001, which would sort of elevate uh Denaro uh, to the head of the mafia and all of Trapani uh under his control he controlled a fucking army the sky was no joke under him were some 900 men allegedly uh which were organized into 20 different families the mafia in Trapani is widely considered to be the most powerful one but with one exception and that is in Palermo uh Denaro would begin basically his career extorting anybody and everyone uh from farmers to car dealerships nothing was untouchable he controlled the majority of all construction rackets took huge kickbacks on public construction projects and even got a huge kickback from quarries uh he would also move into narcotics rackets forming business relationships with the Contrera Karuna clan throughout the 80s and 90s the uh Contrera Karuna clan uh, were the big movers and shakers in the narcotics trade. The Contrura Karuna clan uh, was formed back in the 50s in Sicily. Uh, all of them were related, and they used marriage to forge strong alliances and ties. And we've seen that in this country, too, with Carlo Gambino and Paul Castellano as well. The Bonanos did it uh, with Bill Bonanno marrying Rosalie Profaci. Ties that bond are through marriage, usually, and that's what organizes them together. Uh, Matteo has a Family lineage throughout of it, throughout Italy and also the United States. His roots in the United States are up in western New York. While the majority of American mob bosses didn't have sort of a chokehold outside of this country, 
Denaro actually does. Uh, he has strong ties in Venezuela as well as close bonds in various cartels throughout the world. He also has very close ties to Andrangheta, uh, and his network extends all around the world, including Germany, Saudi Arabia, Greece, Canada, the United States, France, uh, Australia, you name it. He's planted a flag there. Uh, not to be outdone, uh, he also has strong ties with some of the biggest crime families in Palermo, especially with the Graviano crime family. Uh, and they are actually related as uh, Filippo Gra Graviano is the brother-in-law of Denaro, so there's the tie there. Uh, but one thing that Denaro has done well is forge ties wherever he can, uh, which has long served him in a lot of different ways. Uh, as mentioned earlier, he had a business agreement with Andrangheta, uh, the clans being from Plotti, Marina del Giarosa, Siderno, as well as the Mariano crime family. He gets a huge kickback from all of their narcotics trafficking. So he was one of the type of guys that realized there was strength in numbers, bonds in numbers, bonds in marriage. And that is the one thing that Sicily has a tendency of doing more so on a more epic scale than Cosa Nostra in the United States. Uh, but we got to move to 1991 and 92. Uh, obviously, Falcone and Borsellino get whacked, Totorino would be arrested, and the government would enact what they called Article 41, which is also called the Prison Suspend and Restrict, uh, the, which is, excuse me, 41. It's also called the Prison Administration Act. Uh, it's known as a hard prison regime, which allows the warden to cripple the mafia. Uh, it also allows them to suspend and restrict certain prison regulations. Uh, and like I said, it was designed to really cripple the mafia at its core, uh, almost in comparison to how the RICO Act works here, but a little differently. And some of the restrictions, and these are important because it shows you the difference between what uh, the American Justice Department does and what the Italian Justice Department does. Uh, in Italy, they can't use the phone, no association or correspondence with anybody, no uh, any meaning that they have or any conversations they have. There has to be a third party from the prison, no money allowance, no packages, no mail, uh, no admittance to exercise, no sporting activities, no voting, no taking part in arts and crafts. I mean, how fucking, how, how demented do you got to be to like go to prison and they won't let you fucking make macrame or fucking puppets or whatever the fuck it is they do there. Uh, they are allowed one visit per month from family and they're only allowed to do so through intercom systems, no family contact, no physical contact. Uh, so in other words, it's locked down 24 seven. Uh, this law pretty much infuriated the mafia. And as a result, the mob was going to end up going to war with the government and Denaro played a role in that. Uh, the leftover bosses, Ma Matteo, Giovanni Brusca, Giuseppe Graviano, Antonio Gia, and Leo Luca Bagarella, and Gio La Barbara, basically met several times and discussed the problem. The first thing is they know the Italian government's going to go after the money. They also know the Italian government's going to do this crazy fucking prison reform, and it, it it's really... And this country would be unconstitutional. I mean, every fucking fringe group for human rights would go fucking after the government if they ever did that here. But they would end up meeting at Leonardo Greco's house. The problem was that they wanted to cripple the Italian government, but were not about to stand for these new bullshit laws that they were going to try to do with prison reform. So their idea was pretty simple. They needed to bend Italy to their fucking knees. But how would they do that? Uh, they were able to control the Italian government with the hits on Falcone and Borsellino, and they would have to essentially do the same exact thing because murder and mayhem controls. Uh, if we look at Pablo Escobar when he started taking on uh, the Colombian government, it worked for him for a long time until everybody got fed up and that, excuse me, and that was that. So what they did was they carried out a series of of bombings in Florence, Milan, Laterno, and in Rome. And these bombings ended up killing 10 people and injured over 100 people. And they destroyed a lot of culturally significant buildings, uh, just sort of an exclamation point on the mayhem. Uh, Maurizio Costanzo, uh, who was a big TV uh, journalist in Italy, was one of these people that sort of spoke out against the mafia and especially against uh, Denaro specifically. Uh, but what he didn't know was Denaro knew about this and wanted him dead and even followed him for a couple of months without Costanzo even realizing it. Uh, he ended up just escaping a car bomb attempt on May of 1993. It's also alleged that Denaro was the one who tailed Falcone, excuse me, Falcone and Claudio Martelli in 1991 prior to their deaths. Uh, to the whack, to the to the hit. So the reality here is that Denaro uh, was complicit in those murders because he kept a tail on them, knew about their whereabouts, spread the information, and ultimately we know what happens when they blow up the fucking freeway. 
Uh, but after the bombings in 93, Denaro goes off the fucking radar. In May of 2002, uh, much as what the Italian government did to Toto Rina, uh, they found him guilty of crimes in absentia, which I, I don't understand how that fucking operates. But basically, they basically hold a trial without you there based on evidence of informants and whatever the government has, and they find you guilty and they sentence you, and if they ever find you, you're fucked. Uh, he ended up getting a life sentence for the role in the bombings in 1993. In 2000, the Italian authorities led an operation to arrest several people who assisted Denaro, and they found two homes where he had been hiding. So all of these contacts that he had, all these relationships they had, were helping him move from place to place to place. This is the same thing that Toto Rina did, uh, the same thing that Provenzano did. Uh, so this is sort of a cultural thing of what they do. It almost echoes the same uh, because the identical thing, like I just said, happened to Toto Rina as well. Uh and so safe havens were offered wherever he needed to go because of his contacts and et cetera. Denaro was never really fond of Bernardo Provenzano, who we talked about a couple shows ago. If you haven't listened to that show, go back and listen to the show. Pretty good show, and you'll understand more of what I'm talking about. Uh, but the younger bosses, and they call them the Young Turks, they wanted the old guard out of the way, very similar to Maranzano uh, and Joe Massaria getting out of the way, same sort of uh, ideal that Lucky Luciano had. Uh, they wanted to make decisions without even having to talk to Provenzano, who was the leader at the time. They just they just wanted to do things differently, and they essentially basically told Provenzano to go get his fucking shine box. Uh, but before Provenzano could actually retaliate for what was going on or make a move against them, he actually gets arrested in April of 2006. As a result, Denaro pretty much takes over the whole entire thing. There was nobody to stand in his way at that point. It was all his. Uh, some authors have said that Provenzano effectively named Denaro boss uh, in prison, but the reality is I don't, I don't really think that that happened. His power base was swallowed up, and I think logically Denaro just pretty much absorbed whatever power vacuum there was. Uh, and Provenzano, however, might have been a better boss in terms of being more conciliatory and not being as violent. Uh, because he was able to handle disputes without violence, whereas Denaro would just kill somebody without a fucking second thought. That was the business, murder. Uh, there was talk that a war could possibly break out because Sao Piccolo was the natural successor by rights and by standing, but with Lo Piccolo having the backing of Palermo, uh, that sort of creates a problem. But before he could even contest Denaro trying to take over, he gets arrested in November of 2007. At that point, it was certain nobody could challenge Denaro for leadership. Uh, all right, so according to Antonio Angroia, which is one of the prosecutors of the Diarzioni uh, anti-mafia or the DDA of Palermo, um, the main leading figures in Cosa Nostra are Denaro, Giovanni Rina, which is Toto Rina's son, Domenico uh, Racuglia, and Pietro Taglavia. Uh, and Gianni Nietzsche. Uh, but he believes that they're really too young to be fully in control of everything. But once again, it's the same thing that we echo over and over and over on this show. Age doesn't matter. It's determination, ferocity, and earning capability and control, and that's the way it'll always be. Uh, but the Italian government actually disagrees completely with that. In November of 2009, uh, Recuglio was arrested near Trapani, and he was also found guilty in absentia for murder and was facing three life sentences. Uh, one of the Italian, one of the things the Italian government has struggled with is how to control the mafia. How do you, how do you keep them down and out? How do you get rid of them? How do you arrest them if they just disappear into the wind? But they use pretty much a two pronged approach, which we've talked about a lot on the show. The first thing is they follow the money and seize everything. And we're going to see going down here shortly how they're doing that. Uh, but like I said, the first thing is how they follow money and seize everything. Uh, the second utilization is taking away the children of mobsters. What they do is if they find you convicted or guilty of being a gangster, they're going to take your kids away. So you have a choice. Either confess, pay your penance, rat, or we're just going to take your fucking kids. That's what they've done, and it's worked. In November of 2008, $700 million was taken by the Italian government from Giuseppe Grigoli, who was the Sicilian supermarket king. So why did they do that? The Italian government was able to ascertain that Grigoli knew that Denaro, uh, that Grigoli knew Denaro, and that was enough to seize his assets. Now with Rico, 
You get triple the time. If you can link one to any sort of crime, like if you're the boss and there's 12 crimes, they can link you to it. They can take your house, your boat, your car, seize your bank accounts, and never give it back, even if you're found not guilty. They don't have to give it back. This is very similar in Italy. The difference is they don't have to prove a fucking thing. Just the accusation gets money taken away from you. That's how serious they are over in Italy about this. Uh, so they allege that Grigoli knew Gennaro and that basically he was somehow funneling money. That was enough. And so they end up taking 12 businesses, 220 real estate holdings, including villas, uh, entire city blocks and 133 land holdings. Uh, Italian authorities arrested Grigoli in December of 2007 when authorities alleged that they found documents that ring- linked Grigoli and Denaro. They found these alleged documents in a hideout where Provenzano had been arrested in 2006. Now, the first question is, why the fuck did Provenzano leave anything laying around? And this is one of the reasons why some have asserted over the years that Provenzano had become a fucking rat. Toto Rina's son, Giovanni Rina, had made claims that Provenzano was bad because Provenzano was really the only bo- only guy who knew where Toto Rina was hiding. Uh, and he found it hard to believe that they found Toto Rina after a fucking delivery. So it's long been asserted that Provenzano was given up information. Uh, that's what Toto Rina's son believed. That's what Toto Rina ultimately believed in the end. But that's going to be like a conspiracy theory bullshit that we could talk about forever. All right. So, it's also alleged that Grigoli was funneling, mon- funneling money made by the mob through his supermarkets, giving mobsters legal cover for a kickback. In 2010, police would seize construction companies, villas, shops, and cars worth $550 million from Rosario Cassio. The Italian government alleged that Cassio had ties to Denaro. So, once again, just the fucking accusation, just the accusation alone. Because that's what they do. If they can make an exa- uh, uh, an allegation that Gregoli was uh, involved with Denaro or helping him or Rosario Cassio uh, was fucking helping him, that's enough to arrest these guys, seize their asset. They uh, Not even arrest them in some case, but just fucking seize their fucking assets to put pressure on them to become a rat, to give up information, and also to put pressure on Denaro to come out of hiding. The Italian government uh, would also take Francesco Pecora's assets in 2009. Between Gregoli, Pecora, the Italian government seized seized $1.4 billion. In 2010, Italian Italian authorities seized $1.5 billion from Vito Nicastri, who was also accused, not arrested, for working with Denaro. Authorities claim that Nicastri dumped money into solar energy to launder money on behalf of Denaro. So in total, $4 $4 billion has been confiscated by the Italian government. They don't have to give it back. They don't have to prove nothing. All they have to fucking do is make a fucking allegation. That's it. You take their you take their earning capability. Now they got to come out of hiding. They've got to do something to make money. Italy's been successful in going after guys by taking money. But in this country, you'd never get away with that shit. You got to prove it. You got to prove it. In 2010, Denaro's brother Salvatore ends up getting arrested with 18 others in an operation called Golem 2. Uh, they were charged with helping organize Denaro's communications in order to help him stay on the run. They were also charged with corruption, association, and protection rackets. In 2011, authorities surrounded a farm 10 minutes outside of Castel Vetrano uh, on the idea that uh, they knew where Denaro was hiding. Uh, the Italian Secret Service had tipped them off, but they were wrong as Denaro was not there. In 2017, 200 officers served search warrants, confiscated properties looking for Denaro. So, to this day, he's still in hiding. He's still in hiding. One thing worth mentioning about all those mentioned earlier about having money seized. Not a single one of them ever faced a day in court. They essentially were robbed at the hands of the Italian government. Suspicion is enough for the Italian government to do whatever they fucking want. In 2018, a thousand uh, Italian authorities arrested Denaro's brother, brother brother-in-law, Rosario Allegra, and 21 others. Um, And of those of that group, six were bosses and 15 were associates. 
uh, Gennaro's a dangerous guy. In 1993, a former member decided to become a rat, Santino Di Matteo. Uh, Santino Di Matteo was actually talking to the police. Uh, as a result, Gennaro has his 11-year-old son kidnapped. Hoping that Santino would recount, recant, and not talk, uh, he was wrong. So what ends up happening is Gennaro and his men kept this guy's son for two years, and then they finally brutally murdered him and dissolved his body in acid. Gennaro's members were caught discussing the murder on a wiretap. One man said, yeah, I know we don't kill kids, uh, but did he, did he not do the right thing? But why didn't he react? He obviously didn't care about his fucking kid. So you have guys talking about the murder of his son saying that, yeah, we don't kill kids, but this guy was told. Why didn't he just recant the fucking story? How much could he really care about his fucking son if he wasn't going to do it? Because maybe the guy stood up for what he believed in. I can't knock anybody for standing up what you believe in. But Matteo Messino Denaro, excuse me, Messina Denaro is no fucking joke. They don't call him diabolic for a reason. He's a playboy. He owned a lot of cars, a lot of money. He was very wealthy, but he's a deadly fucking individual. He does not hesitate. Allegedly 50 murders under his own belt. This is a guy who very much was like Toto Rina to the extent where he could hide and move, hide and move. And the government who can't really find these guys, they have two options. Take the kids. Maybe that works. Or you take the money. This is one thing that the FBI in this country really doesn't do. They don't follow money. They just go to rats. That's all they do is go to rats. That's where they get their fucking, their, uh, their gavel from. That's where they get their information from. Uh, you know, but RICO laws allow the government to take houses, cars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They can make threats to your family that, you know, we're going to arrest your husband and then we're going to bankrupt you. You're going to be thrown out on the streets. This is the tactics that the FBI uses. Whereas in Italy, they follow the money trail. They seize all the accounts, all the money, because if you rob a guy of everything he's got money wise, you almost draw him out and the public. So you have to hope that there's enough money going around that this guy doesn't need for nothing. Uh, still to this day, Matteo Messino Zanaro is still hiding, in hiding. Toto Rina did the same shit for some 20 fucking years. These guys know how to hide in farmhouses. They know how to stay off the radar. They can move to and from and in and out of the country, but they have enough power to pull a trigger from fucking four continents away. That's the power these guys have. That's the big difference between Italy and the United States. Back in the 60s, Ray Patriarch could pick up a phone and have somebody killed in fucking Oklahoma. Not a problem. Sam Giancana could pick up the phone, have a guy whacked down in Florida. didn't fucking matter. New York these days, sure, you might be able to have it done, but not on the fucking epic scale that these guys operate on. He's a very serious guy, a very deadly guy, and he is, according to what the American FBI says... Uh, the NSA says is the de facto leader of the mob in Italy. But like I said, everything, uh, you know, the, the families in, in Palermo are insanely strong. And then you've got all these little cliques and these little clans all throughout Italy. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because this is a guy that took part in the killing of a judge, a prosecutor, uh, didn't hesitate to murder a fucking woman who was pregnant and her husband didn't hesitate to have an 11-year-old child murdered. This is a guy you don't want to fuck with. Sometimes the nickname fits. Diabolic. Diabolic. All right, so that's all we're going to have for today. There's not a lot of information on him, to be honest with you, as far as his childhood and stuff like that. But uh, we will definitely...